But anyway, so now we get, now we're in Corpus Christi and we go to Austin, Texas. And two things, um, two things happen in, in Austin at the back room. It's another famous little club. Gary's uh, guitar that was his red strap that had little stickers all over it, a fender, I think it was. And you can probably go back and see old pictures of it, but it was stolen right from the the uh, load in, not even oh. the load out. It was the load in of the guys that were taking the gear <clears throat> in. Somehow someone stole it. And that was a real bummer because it was Gary's favorite guitar at the time. And then he only brought one other one. But anyway, so we were in the, so it got stolen in this. And I'll never forget, the back room is a small club. So there was a back alley where where you load in, and that's where they stole the guitar in this little alley. Hmm. But I remember, I wasn't uh, fully versed. I could drive a truck and drive a kid, but I wasn't, you know, great at parking it or pulling up and intricate, you know, things yet. I was learning, but I wasn't there yet. And I remember the guys go, uh, that were at there. Okay, back it in. I was like, back it. In. How how about if I just drive straight in and I'll back it out? And they go, well, you can do that, but most people back it in. But I didn't, so I drove straight in. They unloaded. At the end of the night, they put it all back in. So I got back in the truck and I said to myself, okay. But there's nobody there to help me. So that's another thing. I never had anybody with me. So yeah. now it's it's you know one in the morning, two in the morning, whatever it was, and I'm you know. All everybody's gone. The bus is gone, and I got to back this thing up. But there was no one to like guide me. So I so I looked ahead and I saw this alley. It went down, and little did I know it got thinner and thinner and thinner. <laughs> so I'm going down this alley, and I'm going, oh, "Fuck, man!" I remember I got right up against the fire escape, and I scraped in the fire escape, and then then I hear this big snap. It was like an arc and this big flash. I had knocked down a power line. The whole neighborhood, <laughs> the power goes out, or at least the area that I was in. Wow. The whole thing goes dark. Now I'm dark, sitting in an alley, and I just have to keep going through. So I got wow. out the other side of this alley. Now I know why they want you to back in, but you don't learn that when no one's there. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and uh, there was a side door, and the side door had a latch. But since I was so close to these telephone poles a telephone pole took the latch and bent it the opposite way and flush up against it so it was like never could use that door again the side door to get in <laughs> and um so that was it and then uh austin and, and i forget where we went after but there was a another place in texas uh where they wanted me to back up against this loading dock and it was an old loading dock and it was made of bricks and i remember uh some people standing there as I backed it in. I hit the, I hit the wall, you know. Yeah. I hit the bricks, and like three or four bricks come down. But they all, they all remembered, you know. The guys would just remember these things, you know. Here you go. You got a, the truck has a big arc on it on the on the on the roof that you can see like this big black thing on white of the truck <clears throat> from where the power line had hit, and then you have this door that can't open. Then a few bricks here. And so, but, okay, so the other part of the story is that while I'm out there driving the truck, so I would go to my hotel room and I would sleep in the day when I got there, and then I would make it out by night, and usually the concerts were already going on, and I'd get to the venue with the, you know, I'd get to the venue, and I'd wait for the loadout, but while I was waiting, I got to see Exodus, so then uh, uh, Mike Cancer goes, why don't you start seeing if you can shoot some videos? You know, so I think the I started. Uh, I forget it was in Texas. It, it might have been uh, Phoenix somewhere. I started shooting like every night that I could. But I chose, and and the thing was, I chose where I shot and what I did. And sometimes, and I just learned. I started shooting them almost every night. And okay, so now we're gonna flip forward from Texas, and we're gonna drive straight up to Chicago. That's where we're meeting Anthrax at the Aragon Ballroom, mm. Celtic Frost, and that's where we're going to do kick off that leg of the tour. And and so we get up there, and right after uh, after we get to Chicago, which was a great show, and uh, my video from Chicago's out there. You can see that. 
but uh, from the Pleasures tour. And the next thing you know, um, it's it's okay. Now the next date is in Boston. <clears throat> So uh, if anybody knows from Chicago to Boston's a little drive, but at the time they're going, yeah, I'll see you in Boston. I go, okay, cool. So I'm getting ready to leave. And then Zetro comes and goes, Hey, well, um, I'm going to ride with you. And at the time, man, I was like, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Come on. Let's go. You know? And, uh, Zetro wanted to ride with me because I had a big fat bag of weed. <laughs> so he loved that. And, uh, and he didn't want to, and you know, he, it was his first tour too. He wanted off the bus a little bit. Knew I had a day off. We were going to get a hotel. Uh, I had a, there was a flat tire somewhere up north there. And we had that fixed, me and um, Steve. And we went to this hotel and we stayed. And we came out the next morning, had our cups of coffee, got in the equipment truck. And what happened there was we were in uh, Kearney, Missouri, which is Jesse James's hometown. And the name of the hotel tell was the jesse james best western and oh, so yeah. i well so we're on our way start driving and i had to drive <laughs> underneath the front overhang or the awning and i didn't read the sign to get because it said you know six foot uh, or six foot five and yeah, clearance maybe, the clearance whatever it was whatever yeah. the clearance was i misjudged it by i didn't misjudge it i didn't didn't notice it and it was uh about a half a foot difference so when the top of the truck hit this overhang the whole truck like felt like it got up off its wheels and stopped at the at the moment of hitting thing and it jumped and it came down and then all of a sudden we hear crack 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 like something like a tree's falling down but it was actually the awning uh, cracking and breaking and it came down on top of the the truck and and when i when the truck stopped in that big jolt and it stopped zetro was rolling a joint and his head was down rolling a joint looking at the joint and his head hit the front <laughs> windshield and it made this big spider web yeah I, I saw that picture on the uh when you guys went over on uh, zetro's toxic vault uh so now this awnings on top of the truck, uh, this hotel. Now, underneath this awning was a brand new Z28. And the lady that owned the Z28 was the person that owned the hotel. And she literally came out of the office crying because her car was was crushed. And this huge awning was on top of the car oh, and man. front of the thing. So anyway. Wow. You know, so anyway, the police got called, and at the and at the time, I took the sign. There was a sign there that gave the clearance, and I took it and I hid it in the cab behind the seat. I hid it, and uh, then the police came. Now, you know, these are, you know, Missouri cops, and they think oh, yeah. oh, people yeah. roll or on drugs. What happened? You know, they're, so they're all like, you know, trying to give me tests, and of course, I wasn't high. I just wasn't even stoned or anything. And so then, uh, since it was a health hazard, they called in a bulldozer and they bring this bulldozer in and it had a, a something, a fork on it or something that they could, uh, anyway, they, they lifted the corner of this overhang and I backed the truck out and then they let it back down, but they had a call in some other equipment because now they had a, a they had to remove this awning because it was a health hazard. You can't have anybody walk underneath it because it was unstable. So they had to knock the rest of it down. And when they knocked the rest of it down, you could look into room 201. <laughs> I took the whole side of this fucking hotel down. Wow. So anyway, yeah, from uh, that's what I'm saying. This tour had many highs and lows. So now <laughs> the low is, you know, so of course... They, they wanted they wanted to cops wanted to give me you know take me in arrest me but they couldn't because it was on private property and all they could do was give me a ticket that i landed up calling in later on and pleading guilty to destroying private property and over the phone i paid a 50 dollar fine mm. so that was uh basically the ramifications of that now it had a lot of things so now 
me and Zetro, okay, we'd gone through that, but the truck's fine. And we were off and on our way, and we got to Boston. Everything's good. And I remember Rick Knolt was standing there when I arrived. And, like, the truck was all looking hoopty by then, you know. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, I go, fuck, I fucked up the truck, Rick. He goes, but, dude, you got my gear here. There's nothing wrong with it. He goes, that's all I care about. So that's what musicians do. They care about the show and yeah. that moment. And, and so, sure enough, um, they they play that show. And the tour is going great. So, anyway, that was Boston. and Or uh, right there, there. Somewhere on that East Coast. I think it might have been Boston or this next city. Um, I, I pulled into a gas station to gas up and while I was inside paying and, and pumping the gas, someone had come up and parked behind me. I didn't know it. So when I, I couldn't, uh, I backed up to get out and I hit this Cadillac. So then I damaged this Cadillac, I exchanged information. So now I, you know, I'm totally, you know, that was it. When I told Tony Isabel over the phone what happened there, you know, um, she just said, "Okay, that's it." So mm. uh, I'm I'm getting uh, the next day. I'm going to be flown home, and uh, I can remember I felt the worst. I was like, yeah. it was like a dog that had been beaten and had his tail between its legs because that's how I came home, and I came home early from this tour. A lot of my friends knew I was on this tour, and here it is. I got fired. I destroyed destruction on a fabulous disaster, what I call it. But the other side of the story, now let's go and go really in depth into it. Because at the time, Exodus wanted to get off this label, off Combat, Combat and they yeah, went right. on to Capitol. But Combat wasn't having it. They had another contract for an album. They wanted their album. They knew they were doing good. They seen what Metallica was doing and they knew it. And they just refused to let them go. Now, now they have to guess who's paying the insurance on the truck. It's the record company that paid for everything. So their insurance and everything else, they're responsible for the damage of this hotel. And I forgot the actual cost. It was like 200 and something thousand. But it could be, you know, in, in 2024, it could well be over 1.5 million. Oh, yeah. for, but if, if you factor in inflation. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So now the damage is done. And guess what? Combat thinks that Exodus had something to do with this accident and that I did it on purpose because they wouldn't release them. So guess what happens? They land up getting released, and that opens the door for them to get onto a, uh, a major label. Okay, so now we go to the second part of the story. So I'm home, and like I said, it's not a good – my first tour ever. I got fired. I'm at home. Uh, you know, thinking about the tour every day, and I think I got through, you know, more than half of it or whatever. So, actually, this tour, we started, like, at Fenders, and they'd made a huge thing. And what they did was they called Tom Hunting's brother, had him fly out, because he said he could drive a truck. Hmm. They flew him out, and he took over, and guess what? He fell asleep in Florida. <laughs> wiped out the whole side of the truck on a guardrail or something. I think they had to get the truck replaced. I think they replaced him. So they knew, you know, when you're young, you, you don't know, but as you get older and these bands get bigger, you, you get people that are responsible and that have done this before. Back then we were just kids. And so was the oh, hunting yeah. brother. But anyway, so unknowns to me, all this shit's going on and there's a barricade that broke in florida and da, 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 da. so now okay so now they're playing the i think it was the oakland civic center i forget it was a show their hometown show on the swing through the tour so now they're coming back home through the south and all of a sudden zetro calls me when i'm home because he goes hey what would you know uh, hey steve hope you're having a good tour fuck you know and he goes he goes, all right, pack your bags, man, because uh, when we come by, we want you to come on to, to come with us. And I and I said, you tell Gary Holt, because he's the leader. I go, you tell Gary Holt, 
I'm not driving that truck again. It had no heater. <laughs> I, I was totally out of, you know, I didn't want anything else happening. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. And so, and so then Gary grab, grabbed the phone from, from Steve and he goes, no, he goes, well, we don't want you to drive the truck, but we've been watching your videos and they are so good. And we're, we're, we try to have somebody film every night, but they don't even do half of half of what you do your 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 videos are great and back then you know if you can imagine in 1988 seeing yourself in a band on screen now on a tour bus you could watch what you just uh you could watch the show and most of the days nowadays that's the last thing a band wants to do but when you are starting out that is something you very much want to see you want to see how people are on the stage, who's where, the placement. You can really critique everything by watching it. And I guess that's what uh, uh, they love watching those videos because, you know, like they weren't doing it ever before. And like I said, they ain't doing it today, but back then they wanted to. And so they, so I did do these good, better than uh, normal. I got better at it. And I did land up jumping on the bus and then i had my own bunk and man what a difference to be on a tour bus and to be on an equipment truck and that's what i did and then we went to did all the rest of that tour and i filmed and then we went to europe and i filmed and uh there's a lot of uh there's a lot of videos not a lot i'd say there's some videos of what i have because one of the things is I never owned the tapes because it wasn't my camera. It was my Kansas camera and I didn't buy the tapes. The band did. And after I'd shoot a show, I'd give it to Kansas and he used to put it in a hall of Burton suitcase and lock it up. But, uh, that's how all those early videos and, um, Exodus was the first band I did. And, but it was like a snowball effect once, um, once we got back home and people knew that um, they had this camera, it was a new thing. And, and then, uh, you know, Zetro's talent and Chuck and Chuck's and Testament. And the next thing you know, you know, one of my favorite bands was Testament. And then uh, I talked to Chuck and him and Eric, they want me to shoot. So the first time I shot Testament was the last tour, the last show of the new order tour at the Omni. And that one's out there also, even they, made it a test made it an un, made it an official unofficial bootleg that's very rare if you can find that but so uh when i started doing that chuck and exodus and the next thing you know they all you know bands forbidden so i landed up buying my own cameras and and uh, shooting a lot of bands and the and the bands that weren't so famous like i said forbidden violence all the bands that i didn't know at the time what it would be but years later uh, Rick Ernst made Get Thrashed uh, a movie that you can get on Amazon Prime right now. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I, I remember that one, yeah. yeah. I'd say that realistically, if I looked at that whole movie, I'd say about 75 to 85% of all the live footage is mine. Hmm. And I remember Rick coming up to me <clears throat> and when he was making it, and, and people are told, well, Walter's got the footage. But you see, back then, band, bands were real secretive. They didn't want you to give out their stuff because it was like bootleg. So it was a no-no for me to give out anything. And uh, and I didn't. And that's, that's one of the things that's so special. But when Rick Ernst approached me, I knew that I could give out all these bands Uh, or portions of their band's live shows, the best ones, because then that would put them in a good light. And it wasn't like everybody was making money. It was a a get thrash the movie telling the history of it. So that's how that came about. So if you see, uh, and I remember Rick Ernst wanted me to, uh, you know, he wanted to know what I wanted. And back then, as now I'm pretty grounded, uh, I don't need money. I don't need a lot of money. You know, uh, I live for experience over money, but, but, um, I told him all I cared is that the bands were seen in the best light possible and that my name was credited, um, somewhere substantial. Right. So, and if you ever watch get thrashed, I think the opening credits to the movie, it's the movie title. And then it goes right. And it says, and it has my name 
really big. And that's all I cared about. And so that's kind of an accomplishment for me to have, uh, to have so much to do with that movie and the way that the story's told, but the only way you get to see what it really was like is through my footage. Because like I said, back then bands weren't letting you film. You couldn't just say, Hey, can I film you? They go, no, no, no. But I built up a lot of trust in the Bay area. So anyway, that takes us, uh, through that. And that's how I got kind of connected, um, through Exodus to Testament and all the other Bay area bands. And I filmed a lot of it and, um, and boom, that's, that's how I, I guess I started, uh, working for these bands because I worked, I've worked for Testament on many tours and Exodus for many of those early tours. And even later on, you know, I've driven equipment. Tr- I just drove Testament's equipment truck down to Los Angeles for a festival with Fear Factory and Machine Head. And I landed up doing Machine Head's merchandise that night, but I drove the truck down. And that takes me back. Let me, let me back to uh, that's today's story because they needed somebody and they know I know how to drive and I'm good because that's what I do. But anyway, back some years, they, uh, I remember in 1999, I go, you know, way back. The Gathering is just about to come out. And guess what? It was Lombardo's one and only tour. And James Murphy's, the only, it was the original lineup from the Gathering album that was on that tour. And we did like a month around the United States. And uh, I remember at the time, uh, before the tour was going to start, uh, Chuck came up to me and he's like yeah he goes all right he goes hey man uh we'd like you to go on tour with this i was like cool all right you know and he goes want you to drive the equipment truck and my mouth just dropped down i was like i and i said chuck you know what i did on the exodus tour you know 10 years before or whatever it was and he goes all it chuck's a man of very few words but when he speaks everybody listens and i'll never forget he said well, I guess you'll be more careful this time. So I drove the equipment truck again. I picked my cousin because I was the worst thing driving alone, but I got my cousin to come with me and which we had a whole tour of, uh, it was great to be with my cousin all around the United States, but that was 1999, the gathering. And like I said, um, you know, the funny thing, uh, and I'll go back before 1999. So after I did the massive damage and was filming everything and I can still remember like, uh, within the, you know, before fabulous disaster, they're still playing some shows, some hometown. There was a hometown, I think a mountain view show. And I remember Gary and, and uh, Gary calls me and he goes, yeah, we want you to uh, drive the equipment. Truck. I said, are you kidding me, man? <laughs> we're we're going to have me driving the equipment. Yeah, we want you driving the equipment truck. So uh, I did it, and it was no problem. And in fact, I was uh, I was gonna drive the equipment truck on the, the Headbangers Ball tour with Halloween and this and that and Anthrax and Exodus. But uh, luckily, I didn't. I didn't. And I just had a film or whatever. So that's how. Uh, and like I said, there's been uh, some up and down stories of uh, <laughs> of music with me, but you know that's that's that story. Mm. Now, what else did you want to ask me? Your opinion on different genres of uh, rock and metal, the different styles. Man, you, you know that's a great question because I'd like to say there's so many styles of metal nowadays. Like you can like metal, but you might not like grindcore. Yeah, like, you might. Crash, but you do like melodic death metal. There's so many, right? You got straight, straight death metal, which I'm not fond of. I have to have melody in my music. Yeah. So, and uh, like that twist into form album by Forbidden. That's right in the middle. It's not fast like Forbidden Evil, but it's more mature, and it's uh, uh you know, it's a, it was a more maturing of that sound, which I'm partial to. So I, I like a good singer. Of course, I like a band like The Haunted that has a, a that type of a singer, a bark. I call them an angry white male barker. Yeah. That's what they sound like when they're singing. They're more like barking lyrics. But some of it goes. Like The, the Haunted, 
was on that first gathering tour. Never heard of that style of music. And there's the Haunted on their first album opening that whole leg, which opened up a whole nother thing for me. But I will say this. This is a good analogy. You know? Okay. Nowadays, when Exodus had reformed in Temple of the Damned, and let's just jump to that era. I forget where that was. 2004. I, I forget the exact year of that. Let's jump to that era. But you see, a lot of these, the godfathers of thrash, everyone's looking at them to make the next big, bad album. And uh, But at, it, at the same time, all these bands in Europe are like, wow, they grow up with thrash, right? But they're younger by 10, 15 years, some of them. And then they say, oh, so that's how Arch Enemy and In Flames, heavily influenced by thrash, but influenced by death metal and then making the whole genre out of it just like the thrash metal genre was born here in sweden and finland and norway all that you know black metal in norway i think melodic death metal would have to be chalked up to sweden but um what's interesting about that is that now go to temple of the damned and these guys are still they they don't know too much about these about that new genre coming out this melodic death metal and I remember playing um, the first album with Angela, and they didn't really know about it. But what's interesting is if you talk to those bands, like I have, Soil Work, In Flames, and all these other guys, they were so heavily influenced by that type, Exodus, Metallica, all those bands from back then, that they took their, uh, they were influenced to make this new genre and to put it in their thing and make it melodic and singing and so, so on and so forth. Okay, that's great. And it totally, you know, look at Arch Enemy. They're bigger than Exodus, bigger than a lot of bands nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. But um, now you <laughs> take it and it gets a little bit better. Now the guys that are the godfathers of thrash like Exodus, now this other type of music is coming out, melodic death metal. And guess what? It has some elements that are different than what they're using you know, some kick drum, some, you know, triggers, whatever. There's uh, differences in that music. And guess what? All those bands re-influenced the originators of the genre so that uh, that their next albums are become more modern. And Right? I think that that's uh, the way it went. Oh, that yeah, yeah, the, the different influences. Again, because now you have the modern-sounding Exodus, which is totally, you know, still on fire still kicking on cylinders but it's been influenced again by other people whereas before they were the originators right yeah so I, that's a really cool little concept how it could go full circle you know come right back around but uh yeah grindcore regular death metal i'm not too fond of now there are bands that do it well like cannibal corpse napalm death napalm death yeah and, you know, and then there's bands that are on the fringe that go at the gates, and I, I, uh, I like, I, I can appreciate it. I can't say that I'm going to get in the car and listen to it, but I'll watch them live and get something out of it. And and it's heavy, and they're and, and they're good for what they do. All those bands, but like you know, Six Feet Under and all that, um, uh, Morbid Angel. I'm not into it, but mm. the melodic death metal, I am totally into it. And was for some years, but as as you notice, that kind of genre has been going stale over the last like five or ten years. It doesn't seem like it's evolving, or it's it's redone, or it's uh, or they're they're they've stepped it back a pace, and it's not as aggressive as it used to be. Everybody's influenced by different things, and like I said, it's no, it's a personal opinion. It's like if you like this glass of wine, you don't like that yeah. glass of but you like this a little better, well, you're going to take what's a little better. And everyone can like what they like. And But as I get older, I find myself, uh, this is another great example and a great question, because of what you said, it's still, it's still these bands, these new bands like Haunt and Riot City, Striker, I could name just a few. There are younger kids playing that older style of music that's just great metal. Right. And it's like, uh, I like that. It's like they're not trying to get it all reinvent the wheel. Yeah. You know, but um, there are that's what I, I listen to nowadays. I'd like to I, I like the, the newer bands that are taking that influence and taking a, a little bit of a backseat 
and playing some straight metal. That's yeah. uh, not enough of it nowadays. But the bands that do it, they're all young too. There's a whole nother uh, genre up and coming, and I hope that uh, it continues to grow. But mm. that's what that's what I think. And I still, you know, what never gets old to me is listening to classic rock because I grew up oh, with yeah. it all. Through. Yeah. I, I saw Led Zeppelin in 1977. You know, so I've been through mm. all that age. But what I'm mainly trying to do now is I get <laughs> really older is I'm trying to like uh, get into the seventies music that I missed. I might not have listened to every album. Maybe I want to hear every Pat Travers album. And whereas before I'd pick songs that I wanted to hear Pat Travers, is a bad excuse because I love Pat Travers, but um, I probably listened to, to them a lot back then, but you get what I mean. I, I'm, I'm trying to still not reinvent the wheel. I'm trying to go back and, and figure because the seventies music music is really cool and it's so laid back for that time period and uh you know and of course i love all that the hair metal in the 80s of course you know everyone was hiding the fact that they liked the hair oh, metal yeah, yeah. if you like that stuff oh you can't hang out with us <laughs> that's right and it was uh, a little more gl- glam you no one wanted to admit it but you know Good quality, good singers, good, great guitar players. Rat, you know, Dawkins, um, you know, Scorpion. I love all that stuff. 